What is up everybody? Welcome to my review of An American Werewolf in London. It seems crazy to think that I've had a channel this long and talked about horror movies this long and have yet to say a single word regarding this film. Well, the reason why we're talking about it today is because on May 31st, me and the other guys in Autop Stream are putting on another 31 on 31. And this time is going to be Vampires and Werewolves titled Creatures of the Night. We did 21 picks among the four of us and then we also gave 10 slots to everybody to vote on. The polls have now closed, but American Werewolf in London and American Werewolf in Paris are both included in those 31 films to be ranked next month. And so I'm going to do a review of both of those, as well as a couple other selections from those 31 films over the next few weeks. So an American Werewolf in London, I would go out on a limb and a pretty sturdy limb and say that this is the most celebrated werewolf film of all time. Typically, it's between this and The House that I often hear people say is their favorite, but the overwhelming majority I often hear point towards this one as the undisputed champion best werewolf film ever created. And I've had a weird relationship with this, call it franchise, because I saw American Werewolf in Paris in theaters when I was seven years old. I loved that movie growing up. You know, we all have those little really bad movies that we liked as a kid because we didn't understand why they were bad movies. And I actually watched American Werewolf in London later on in life. And I've seen it numerous times. I have a lot of things that I'm going to say that are going to be high praise for it. But I got to be honest with you, it's never been one of my absolute favorites. People were shocked when I did my top 50 horror films and there was no mention of this movie. And there's a reason for that. And I'll get into those. Hold the phone. Allow me to interrupt past Cody for just a couple of minutes. While turning into a werewolf might not necessarily be the biggest concern in most of our lives, cybersecurity and identity theft absolutely is no matter what the lunar cycle is. So let's take a moment to discuss why you need Aura in your arsenal, the sponsor of today's video. As the internet has continued to advance, larger and larger pieces of our lives are tied to online accounts, social media presences, and cybersecurity and identity theft have now become a bigger concern than ever before. In fact, identity theft is the largest growing crime in this country with a new victim nearly every 14 seconds. And that's why I'm excited to partner today with Aura, which is an easy to use app that has every single tool that you will need to stay safe online. Identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, VPN, password management, and antivirus software. And with Aura, you'll also get near real-time notifications of credit inquiries in case somebody is trying to open up a credit card or take out a loan using your name. And while I'm sure most of you watching probably have one or a few of these in your arsenal, if you don't have every single one of them, it's kind of like locking your doors at night but leaving all of your windows wide open. In fact, the day that I activated my Aura account, I got over 50 notifications of my email address showing up on the dark web. That's a section of the internet where hackers buy and share your personal information. So let Aura do the heavy lifting to keep you safe online by using my exclusive link and getting a 14-day free trial. And you will be shocked at how much of your personal information they'll protect in just those 14 days. So go to Aura.com slash Cody Leach or use this QR code to start your trial of Aura today. And thank you to Aura for partnering with me on today's sponsorship. So starting off with the positives for An American Werewolf in London, we'll get the obvious out of the way first. The uh, practical effects and the werewolf transformation and the gore effects by Rick Baker, some of the best stuff ever created, literally. I mean, it's been 40 plus years since this film came out and it's still the greatest werewolf transformation that has ever been put to film. And it's still some of the best makeup and practical effects that have ever been put to film. That Oscar was well-deserved by that man. And Rick Baker has gone on to do many other things within the, uh, the movie sphere, as well as just specifically horror. He also did the werewolf transformations in The Howling, which just like the movie is often contended to be the second best in a werewolf transformations ever created. And even today, the effects when you watch that transformation scene or you see like the Nazi werewolf dream sequence or even just the progressively deteriorating skin and gore effects on Jack that we see throughout the film and all the different apparitions and the scenes that he comes to talk with David. All of that stuff still looks just as awesome and just as gnarly today as it did back in the 80s. And that is the reason why practical is and always will be God, especially when it comes to horror films. Like there's so many horror films we can point to where there's really bad examples of CGI. 
and it could have been five years ago and five years later, it looks even more like shit. This is 40 plus years later and it still looks just as awesome as the day it was put on film. And it's always fascinating whenever you watch some behind the scenes stuff or you listen to Rick Baker talk about how they achieve certain shots like with the werewolf hair protruding out through the skin. He just poked a bunch of hairs through rubber, pulled it out and then they reversed the footage and putting little mechanisms inside of a rubber hand to show it slowly stretching, same with the face. When you're hearing about the process and the different ways that they utilize what they had to create these effects, it seems so simple simple that it just makes it all the more impressive that they were the first ones to do it. They were the ones that did it best and we haven't gotten anything better since. Also beyond the gore effects and the transformation, just the werewolf design in and of itself, I think is a solid argument for coolest werewolf that we have ever seen in a film. And there's a lot of different versions of werewolves. There's a lot of different iterations we've seen. You get things like this where it's a wolf that walks on all fours. We've seen quite a few movies where the werewolves walk around on two feet and have a little bit more of a human edge to them. We've seen werewolves that look like not wolves at all, like bears. Hi, Silver Bullet, I love you, but what the fuck? And even though you don't really get to see the full wolf for more than a couple of seconds at a time, you get to see just sections of it. You get to see its face, you get to see it bite, you get to see like the eyes open up, or you get that one shot from far away in the subway where it's just walking in on all fours. You get to see it for just a quick little glimpse. Even though we never get to see a full establishing shot of what the werewolf actually looks like, all of the pieces put together makes for what I would call the coolest werewolf we've ever seen. There's no question why Joe Rogan has like a life-size recreation of that werewolf inside of his studio. And I wanna know who the fuck made that for him and how much do I have to pay to get one. Another thing that I really appreciate about this movie, especially on this most recent rewatch, is that I think there's a really creative exploration of survivor's guilt here. I mean, on the surface, it's a very simple premise. You have two Americans that go off into a foreign land where they're a fish out of water, don't know what the fuck they're doing, and they get attacked by a beast, one of them dies, one of them doesn't, and slowly we start to see the beast come out in the other person. It's very simplistic, but you get underneath all of that, and especially with all of the interactions between David and Jack. Ah! You're not real. I don't be a putz, David where you have Jack kind of throwing guilt onto David and saying like, look, man, I am in purgatory until you kill yourself. I am going to be walking the earth and continuing to deteriorate until you die. There's going to be more people that are going to be hurt by your presence until you die. And even just the werewolf curse in and of itself is kind of like a secondary personification of that guilt to where seemingly from David's perspective, the only way to rid himself of that survivor's guilt and rid himself of the constant hallucinations and thoughts and memories of his friend that died, that clearly he feels like he should have been the one to die throughout the movie, or at least should have died with him. The only way to escape that is through death. And it's really dark, it's really fucked up, and I don't necessarily think you could make a movie with that message today without there being a ton of executives saying, oh, you can't quite do it that way. But when you look beyond just the basic werewolf story, I like the fact that there's something else being said there. The memories of your lost loved one, your lost friend, or your lost child, or whoever it may be, kind of haunting you like a ghost and whispering in your ear in your quietest moments, that seems like exactly what everybody describes it to be. And this is just like a really supernatural version of that. I also appreciate the really dark tone that this movie goes for. And it's easy to forget because it's always billed as a horror comedy. And a lot of people latch into the more sillier elements of the movie. And you know, there's certainly some aspects of it to where it tries to continuously remind you of that other part of the tone. But this is a very unforgiving movie movie. It's very cynical. It is very dark. It is very bleak. And whenever I get into the third act, especially, I always like have this moment of revelation where I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot. This is where the movie just goes absolutely balls out, kills tons of people in the streets of London and ends on a downer note and then says, fuck you, credits roll. I mean, it's almost non-conventional how far they go to just be 
extra bleak in this movie. Every tiny little nugget of a storyline or a story thread or a side piece that is going to eventually lead to a happier version of a resolution of this film just immediately gets cut off. I mean, they have the police investigation where he goes off to try to figure out things. He's trying to help David, can never get anywhere. You get these other two investigators that come in, they make a fool of themselves, and immediately that goes nowhere. There's a, a moment of a hint that maybe pure, true love can break the werewolf's curse. And you got old nurse hot pants that is going down the alley when all of London has their guns pointed at David and she's gonna be the one to save him. And that, nope, doesn't quite go that way. It's a movie that goes against the grain in almost every single way that you would think of. In a more traditional Hollywood story, this would have a happier ending. This would have them embracing each other with him having quite a few questions to answer and probably a lot of jail time. But nonetheless, I like the fact that the movie continuously teases you with a little bit of a brighter direction, and then says, no. Oh, a gun would be good. Yes, you just put the gun to your forehead and pull the trigger. But if you put it in your mouth, you'd be sure not to miss. And going along those same lines of bleakness and all of these little threads in the story just leading to nothing, I like the fact that the movie doesn't bother itself to explain the slaughtered lamb or the moors or the origins of these werewolves or anything. It gives you fucking nothing as far as information of where this shit came from or what's going to happen now. Even where you got the investigator that goes back to the slaughtered lamb and starts to go through the same exact process that David and Jack did where they show up and people are acting a little bit off and a little suspicious and it gets him nothing. He walks away and you as the viewer walk away with absolute blue balls. No explanation of what's going on with the pentagram star or is the Moors like some weird werewolf society or are these people like bringing sacrifices to the werewolf? So many questions, zero answers. And I kind of like that when I would normally be annoyed. And by the way, let's pause. All these people inside of the slaughtered lamb, all the workers, all the regulars, all the people having good times, telling jokes, can we not agree that they are the biggest fucking assholes in any horror movie ever? I mean, let's just talk about this right now, okay? They're hanging out in the slaughtered lamb, having a good time. Two Americans come in, minding their own business, just sitting down, just wanting a little something to eat. A dude tells us joke at the expense of Americans. They laugh it off, and then they just say, hey, by the way, what's that pentagram over there? And everybody shuts down. And you got the dude being a gigantic bitch about his fucking dart game. And they say, no food here for you. You need to go. Get the fuck out of here. Beware the moon. Stick to the path. Steer clear of the moles. They send these two helpless dudes out there to get fucking mauled, have a weird attack of conscience at the last second, show up just too late to save one of them, save the other one for reasons that don't make any sense when they know what the fuck he's gonna turn into. They let him loose into London and just say, well, fuck it, we're far enough away, whatever happens, happens, and it's not really gonna affect us, right? And then you get the investigator that comes along and they have an avenue to tell the world about whatever the hell is going on in the moors or whatever the hell's going on with David. And they're not at all culpable for what's going on, aside from being assholes. And they're like, yeah, no, no food here for you, sir. Get out of here, beware of the moon, stick to the path, steer clear of the moors. Even get the one pussy who was being a bitch about his darts who has an attack of conscience, he starts letting details out and you get the one fucking dude that just pops up. That's enough! Fucking assholes. And finally, you gotta give it up to the soundtrack of this movie, baby. One of the best. CCR, I see a bad moon rising. This movie and Supernatural season one, best utilizations of that song ever. Moving on to the mix, and I'll say David Naughton's performance as, well, David. Uh, there are parts of this movie I think he does really well. Uh, whenever he has to express sadness, whenever he has to express worry whenever uh, certain elements of him expressing pain and the, more of the horror stuff and when his performance dives more into the horror side of this movie i think he does a pretty good job it's the comedy side that i'm not the biggest fan of and i'll get more into it being probably a, just a victim of the writing more so than his performance possibly but i think that there are many moments throughout this film to where his performance comes off a little overly silly and not as convincing as it could be. He's still fine. It's not like, you know, he's, he's terrible or anything like that. It's just, as a movie in the 80s, there's plenty of movies I can point to that go for these types of things where I genuinely feel like the central performance is part of what's so great about it. And I feel like what surrounds David is what's so memorable and so good about London. Not David himself, not Naughton's performance itself. You look awful. Thank you. I'm sorry. I 
I didn't mean it. I don't know what I'm saying. And the one of the moments that I always laugh out loud, even though it's about to be the best part of the movie, a moment that I always burst into laughter, which I don't know is, if it was intentional or not, is right as the transformation scene starts. And he's just casually sitting there reading a book. Jesus Christ! The rest of that scene, his performance is awesome, but the actual, like, kickoff point... I always laugh. Am I alone? And the other mixed element is the romance between David and Nurse Alex. Now, on the positive side of things, I like the fact and appreciate the fact that it is different and it's unique. It's not the typical kind of Hollywood glamorized soap opera version of romance with these two lost souls finding each other and then their love buds throughout this horrific situation. It's not that whatsoever. Nurse Alex sees this dude that she wants to fuck. She nurses him back to health enough to where he can fuck and then she takes him home and fucks him. And what 20-something American man does not have a absolute fantasy of going off to a foreign land and hooking up with a hot nurse for a weekend. I mean, I get it. There's an appeal there. But narratively, not the most exciting thing in the world. Not the most intriguing or the most, uh, not the biggest thing that I can really latch into as far as an audience member. And the fact that she actually starts to have feelings for him, I never quite buy into. And I'm kind of glad the fact that they went with that very bleak version of the ending to where their true love doesn't actually save him from the full moon because I would have never bought it. I mean, she fucks the dude, and then immediately after that, he starts acting like the biggest nut and just starts spouting off this weird shit about seeing dead people, and I'm a werewolf, and I'm gonna kill people, and he's running around the streets of London, like, Queen Elizabeth's a man, and Winston Churchill's full of shit. Like, that's the moment where you look at him and you go, okay, that dick was great, but see you later. And she doesn't do that at all. She sticks with him, and she goes deeper and deeper into everything with him, and tries to block him off from the police, and tries to take him to get investigated, and she just keeps going miles and miles beyond what any logical person would do. I mean, that fucking sex must have been amazing. He must have had her howling at the moon. Please let me help you. I love you, David. And now moving on to the negatives, and I will say as a movie that is made by a pretty popular comedy director and a movie that has always been billed as a horror comedy, I have never found this movie to be funny whatsoever. A naked American man stole my balloon. I have never gotten any appreciation out of the comedic side of this film. And in a lot of ways, it actually takes away from my experience quite a bit. First of all, I don't know if maybe the humor is just dated, or maybe it's a bit more of a British humor, which they're notorious for being a little bit more dry, and it very rarely will make me laugh. It's just my style of humor. But every time I watch this film, I'm waiting for the funnier side of things to come up, and it just never quite does. And it creates a bit of a tonal imbalance that I don't completely appreciate, because I like the fact that the movie's bleak and it's dark and it's unforgiving. And I actually think if you were going to put in comedy here, that would be a really good mix to have to kind of bring a little bit of levity to give a bit of a palate cleanse from all the darkness and the bleakness, but because it's not effective comedy for me personally, it just makes the movie feel off balance the entire time to where you have these jokes and you have this back and forth and you have this physical comedy attempted by David Naughton where he's you know, given faces in the subway and everything, and it just doesn't feel like the same movie to me. Where the intention is clear, if the intention is to kind of give you some moments of relief and give you some very dark and fucked up imagery and then kind of follow it up with some, some absurdist comedy or a physical gag or just a line that's supposed to give you a little bit of a giggle, I get the intention there, but this side of things has never worked for me. So what ends up happening is I see a lot of dark, fucked up, very bleak things happening in this movie. And then when John Landis tries to shift the tone over to the other direction, it ended up just kind of coming off awkward to me. And that's one of the main reasons why, as much as I genuinely like this movie, and as much as I would absolutely agree it's one of, if not the best werewolf movies ever made, it's never been one of my favorite films of all time. I probably have a good seven or eight vampire movies that I would put above this. I probably have other werewolf movies that I might on a certain day put above this because narratively, tone-wise, it just works a little better for me. Amazing things done in American Werewolf in London. And I also find the story itself to be a bit bare bones. Sometimes that can work to your advantage, and in a movie like this where they're certainly trying to put some of the practical effects and the shock value of the transformation scenes and things like that to be the forefront, and that's absolutely what they achieved, because that's what this movie has been known for for 40 plus years, 
but narratively I've always found it to be not as satisfying as it could be. And it's very, very simplistic. And when I don't necessarily endear myself fully to the David character, when I don't fully get invested in this romance or this fling or whatever you want to call it with Dr. Alex, and I don't necessarily appreciate some of the more humorous sides of the film, all I really have to look forward to is the darkness, the bleakness, and the practical effects, which are awesome. But all of those added together is why, while I would agree this is a great movie, and while I always enjoy rewatching it, and I would probably say this is in the top two best werewolf films of all time, it's never been my easy answer for number one, and it's never been one of those horror films that has easily slid into my list of favorites, because by the end of the film, as much as I enjoy it, I'm always left feeling a bit empty by the end of it. I'm, I'm always left feeling like there was something else I wanted the movie to do that just never quite got there. To the point that this is one of those proven classics that I would say I'd be curious to see a modern remake of it. As long as you got a very competent modern filmmaker who is passionate about the original, understands why the original was so loved and continues to be so celebrated, and above all else is passionate about practical effects that is going to try to do their own balls out transformation scene, I would love to see that come to fruition because narratively and character wise, which are always my two highest priorities when I walk into any movie, there's a lot of opportunities to do maybe something a little bit more appealing for me with that. So all in all, guys, this is absolutely a proven classic of the genre. It does not need my seal of approval, but it gets it anyway. I think that the practical effects, the transformation scenes, the darkness, the gore effects are all some of the best, maybe the best that have ever been put to film. It's a really fun, enjoyable movie that I don't know if it could get made the same exact way today. And there's always a bit of a special place in my heart for movies like that. But narratively and character wise, it's never been a movie that has really done a ton for me. So while I really enjoy it, never been one of my favorites of all time. And those are the reasons why. Hopefully you understand that. If not, oh fucking well. All right, guys, if you enjoyed that, please click over here for a playlist of all of my 2023 new release reviews so far. And I'm also going to put a playlist of the 31 on 31 videos so you can get a bit of a pregame going before May's video. Please like and share and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the 31 on 31 video in May. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.